home stretch. Uh, so we're now going to go into our uh, third session, um, and this is going to be uh, focusing on uh, implementation issues uh, surrounding uh, genomic uh, CDS. And our uh, moderators for this session are Ken Kawamoto and Casey Overby. Uh, so we'll let them go ahead and uh, uh, set the stage. So we'll just uh, introduce ourselves real quickly. Uh, my name's. Pull it down a little bit more. Okay. Speak more loudly. Okay. <laughs> um, my name's Casey Overby, and I'm uh, at University of Maryland School of Medicine in the Program for Personalized and Genomic Medicine and Center for Health Related Informatics and Bioimaging. And my background's in uh, biomedical informatics. Uh, I did my PhD in, um, and postdoc in, in biomedical informatics and uh, also some bioinformatics previously, previous to that as well um, with a focus on clinical decision support. And uh, I, I've, I've been involved with several of the NHGRI funded um, projects like eMERGE and um, IGNITE. So the implementation, uh, I'll be able to contribute to those implementation, dis the implementation discussion um, based on some of the experiences that we've had in those projects. Great. So I'll introduce myself too. Um, so I'm Ken Kamoto. Uh, I did a lot of my training uh, at Duke. Um, and had the mentorship of uh, Jeff Ginsburg there. That was great. Um, right now, uh, I'm at the University of Utah. I've been there for about three years. I'm heavily operational. I'm one of the associate chief medical information officers, uh, focused uh, a lot in this kind of area. Uh, I also am heavily involved in standards, so I uh, co-chair the HL7 Clinical Distance Support Work Group, and uh, I've been working uh, on behalf of ONC and CMS for a variety of their standards initiatives in the clinical distance support space. Um, I, co I uh, uh, coordinated something called Healthy Decisions, which was ONC's efforts to develop standards in clinical distance support. And now I'm uh, uh, co-coordinating an initiative called Clinical Quality Framework, which is taking the CMS-related uh, uh, quality measurement standards and combining them with the clinical distance support standards. So um, uh, uh, very much in standards. And I also, um, uh, through uh, NHGRI funding, developed an open source clinical distance support framework called OpenCDS that we're actually now using operationally in a number of areas, and some companies have built it into commercial EHR systems and is being deployed in the VA. So um, have a... Uh, a uh, lot of interest there, and Brandon actually used that framework for prototyping uh, doing genomic clinical distance support. And so, uh, just wanted to remind everybody of some of some of the survey results that are related to this topic of implementation issues around genomic CDS. Um, one uh, one of them is. Uh, maintaining the linkage of molecular observations to laboratory methods used to generate them. And uh, this may also include uh, the analysis methods and um, keeping track of uh, that providence that we were talking about earlier. Uh, another top, another survey response related to this is support for both individual cl clinical care and discovery science. And there's also been some discussion about uh, being able to keep the genetic information separate from the knowledge, uh, so that you can support those those as well. And um, another topic is clinical decision support knowledge must have the capacity to support multiple EHR platforms with various data representations with minimal modifications. And then the third, and then the fourth one was leveraging current and, and developing CDS genomic standards. And so these are things that we can think about during this discussion. Um, we have the three questions that we can, um, that we can talk about as well. Um, just. Uh, related to some of my experiences, some of the uh, influencers of, of implementation are uh, characteristics of the existing systems that might be a topic that we can um, discuss uh, through experiences in, in both uh, eMERGE with cl in collaboration with CSER and, and, and IGNITE. There's a diversity in the types of, um, of clinical decision support. Um, available at the different sites and diversity and also the projects that are being pursued. And so can, um, thinking about the, the characteristics of, of, uh, of these different sites is something um, that is, is a consideration in implementing. Also, um, there are existing uh, priorities that need to be considered. 
such as meaningful use requirements and um, I know many of the universities and institutions are maybe switching the clinical to switching their their vendor systems and so keeping that in mind uh, in implementing in impl implementing projects also uh, we can in, in um, information science we a lot of times draw from uh, theories um, behavioral theories technology theories and those can be considered um, a way to understand the best ways to to uh, have uptake of decision support projects and so that's one of the topics that's talked about a lot in the ignite network um, and and then also considering the context has come up several times as well already so who who is our audience um, and when uh, is it the healthcare provider is it the uh, is it the patient? And there's been a little bit about the patient, but um, I've been exposed more to uh, our, our biobank initiative that we're getting started. Um, and there could be some venues for for uh, decision support for patients, as if their data is being collected. How do you um, how do you uh, have a venue for um, educating them over time on on understanding their risk in the context of of their uh, conditions that they currently have? And, and there are several other questions that we can think about. Great. So, um, so I don't have to wait in line to raise my hand to provide some comments. I'll go ahead and start with some comments. <laughs> um, so uh, so the, just some thoughts on some of these questions. So the uh, first question about um, how should we provide uh, this kind of distance support and workflow, um, I think that's obviously a really key question. Um, we, we've talked around it, but like what is it that's going to be the end user experience and I think some key questions to think about is you know from an end user perspective what's that going to look like what's that ex experience going to be specifically what content is going to be provided and what are the technical options that we may want to use so there's a variety of different mechanisms to deliver clinical distance support what should we be targeting and I'm just going to provide a little bit more thoughts on just the second question uh, how can uh, this be done in a scalable manner? And this is something that I know a lot of folks like Blackford and others have been really, really focused on. And it really comes down to it's great if we can do it at one site, but then we've done it at one site. And then especially if what we did at the first site required, say, external support and funding to do, how you, you obviously can't replicate that at 2,000 clinical sites, so how are you going to do that? And some of the thoughts uh, in particular here uh, would be around standards. Um, uh, we, you, can't re you can't interoperate it unless you have standards like we've been talking about. Architecture, we talked about different approaches. I think a key part is uh, ROI, which we haven't really talked about, the return on investment. It sort of comes down to we only do things when it makes sense from a, you know, at least from a value and financial perspective, from an institutional perspective. Um, and this is, again, getting away from the grant and research perspective, but the, I think the intent is to come up with approaches that, regardless of whether NIH is funding it, institutions will do, because NIH can't fund clinical implementation throughout the country. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about how we can demonstrate clear return on investment uh, for implementing these kind of systems. And then uh, the last point I thought uh, we can really focus on is alignment because there's so much going on that's large and really on everyone's mind. And if we aren't part of those thought processes and decision processes, then it's not going to work out. So one is, what are EHR vendors and systems doing? I think um, uh, it, we really should start by saying, what is easy to do in current EHR systems? How are they architected? What is their philosophy on doing things? And we should start by saying, how do we align there? Uh, rather than thinking of how they should change. I think we should start with the assumption that let's do what works in current EHR systems, and then if there's deficiencies, then point it out and say, can we work on this? But I, my personal belief is there's so much you can do using current EHR technologies. Uh, another key players, uh, ONC and CMS, um, they are heavily involved in this area for obvious reasons um, and actually have uh, regulations and mandates, et cetera, that uh, it would, I think, be silly for us not to be aligned with. Uh, in particular, there are standards efforts in this area that are highly, highly aligned and I think can be easily adapted uh, to these areas. Uh, there are uh, standard development organizations, or SDOs, in particular HL7. Uh, there are other groups like IHE. We really should align there, I think. 
Uh, there's a number of open source efforts. So uh, I mentioned my colleague uh, Guilherme Delfield's open info button effort. Uh, I work on this open CDS thing. Um, basically, uh, my thought is, you know, if there are freely available open source tools that anybody can contribute to, and there's no intellectual property associated with it, that's a pretty nice platform to to develop something that, in particular, can be um, taken up by um, other uh, groups. And then in terms of alignment, I just wanted to add one other group, which was the institution. Um, so uh, oftentimes decisions, at least in operational clinical perspectives, has to align with the priorities and incentives of the institution we're in. So um, uh, if we, for example, bring up a, a genomic clinical distance support use case, the questions are going to be the same questions that are going to come up for anything else you propose in institution. Why do we want to do this? Why is this a higher priority than implementing this meaningful use requirement? Or why is this a higher priority than dealing with this particular clinical issue we're, we're dealing with or, uh, in, you know, uh, implementing uh, patient self-pay in the personal health record? And I think we need to uh, be very thoughtful about how we align with what's important to healthcare systems and what it would be that would make these systems want to implement these uh, technologies and approaches we're talking about. Uh, when we uh, present to them and say, hey, look at what we've done, and this is how easy it is for you to do it, and here's the return on investment, and here's technology to help. So um, so that was just uh, some of uh, my initial comments, but maybe uh, what, we, what Casey and I can do is just uh, open this up for discussion, and um, I, I, I do think uh, it might be useful because we've been talking pretty technically uh, to start with the workflow issue, and especially if they're practicing physicians and clinicians here, they could comment on what they would think would be the right ways that genomic clinical distance support should be provided. So maybe I should scare Kurt and, and uh, put him on the, uh, uh, on, on the hot seat here to get, get us started since that you did, in fact, uh, uh, open your mouth. Uh, uh, about this issue earlier, so if you're willing to uh, maybe uh, take the uh, opening salvo on that, I'll give you the opportunity. I'm going to say things that are you're not supposed to say, if that's okay. Um, among the things I would say is that, you know, the average physician, when they're in their office, they're focusing on accomplishing the tasks at hand to complete their day and they are unlikely to want to do things. Among the things we would like to be happen having happen is to collect, you know, for example, structured data about phenotypes of individuals so we could have data um, to figure out how to calc do that Bayesian calculation to figure out what's significant about variants in the genome. But there is no way that, you know, you're going to get the physicians to collect that data unless there's an incentive for doing it. Um, or it's very, very easy. I mean, I could imagine if you could make it easy enough so they could accomplish it while doing their tasks, they might do it. But if you, if you go to a physician and say, I'm, I'm thinking about this idea, can you, you know, fill out this survey form every time you do it? It just never happens. And the other thing that I think, you know, it's sort of the 800-pound elephant in the room, I think uh, Heidi sort of uh, spoke to a little bit, and that, you know, the 800-pound elephant is that the billings, you know, that the EPIC and things like it are billing systems. They're not designed for collecting structured data and getting data out of it in a research point of view. And we're having a huge amount of time to put additional things in there that we'd like to do if you wanted to do a structured thing. And, and it's not just EPIC, it's everyone. You know, the, the homegrown medical record system we used at UNC before that had the same property, and you can understand why. Um, I think the, you know, the Although, you know, I like to look at genomic data and things like that, you know, coming to solutions with decision support is going to be absolutely essential and, of course, it's going to have to be very context-specific in general. Um, and it's going to have to be dynamically telling you what you need to know when you need to know it if it's going to get used. You know, I think uh, Dan's comment about, you know, you can only put, keep so much in your head before it explodes uh, is sort of apropos. You know, I think there's a, a couple of interesting dimensions to the, the pure clinical perspective on where and how to provide the genomic CDS. And one question that, you know, we've kicked around for a long time is to what degree can the patient supply, you know, the family history with sufficient detail and rigor or a proxy for the patient perhaps to uh, supply a family history? And if we were to ask them to do that, what are the key 
things we would ask of them. Certainly there are some models with the Surgeon General's tool and whatnot, but I'd love to know if we could wrestle down that issue because it might really help from the clinician side, you know, a lot of data gathering, which is kind of rote or, or you know, mundane. Can I, I'd like to follow up. Um, in, one, in a former life, I worked on uh, non-Alzheimer's dementia, and it turned out it was be pretty, turned out to be really important. And it turns out it's one of the most common causes of non-Alzheimer's, hereditary non-Alzheimer's, non-Alzheimer dementia. And when I sort of stumbled into this space because of a family, it wasn't known by any physicians. And so we started figuring out how we'd identify patients when physicians didn't know how to see the patients. We learned that, in fact, we could ask, care, we could ask questions of caregivers using uh, simple instruments that experts helped develop that would get at that, where we could get as much information from a caregiver with an unskilled person as you could possibly get from a physician that didn't know what they were looking for. And, and so I think, you know, you can imagine doing this in spades. I mean, the, the physician is sort of a rate limiting step in a lot of this, and I think it's the historical perspective that is the physician being the center of the universe where he communicates to peers as a courtesy and, you know, that, you know, that's from ancient times practically is how this system is still evolving and working. And I think, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to undergo drastic changes in the near future because we have these terrible problems that we've alluded to today. And I think that it's likely, you know, that, you know, for uh, genetic medicine and stuff, it's, it's all the problems that, you know, that are present in the rest of medicine in spades. You know, we've all had the experience of hearing something bad happen from genetics. I've known people that misinterpreted results and got, you know, bilateral mastectomies because they didn't really understand what was going on. And so, you know, you hear about stuff like this and it's happening and we're, we have the potential to do a lot of harm and we have to take care of a lot of issues. You know, excellent uh, points all. You know, the second part of it, I guess, is beyond who's gathering those data, which might be relevant to genomic CDS, how do we actually fit them into the workflow? And it's, what I'm, I want to explore a little bit further, perhaps, is, you know, we think about classical clinical decision support to be oftentimes just the reminder on something which is, you know, kind of important to do, easy to forget, doesn't fit into my normal cognitive pattern or what or whatnot. But I wonder if we know whether or not genomic CDS is actually of the same character, or is it actually something which is more reflective, requires a little more thought uh, to interpret and use the information, and is really not akin to a pop-up reminder of any kind whatsoever? Josh, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think one of our observations um, has been that there's many pathways that you can have genomic information affect care. So. Uh, because of its persistent value, simply having it displayed in the EMR in a prominent place or in a structured way can influence care. Um, and also you can have people like a pharmacist uh, use the information to prompt change in care. And that can actually happen before all the conditions come together for CDS to fire. So um, I think before we actually implemented our program, we were thinking CDS would be uh, the first thing that would happen, but in many cases it's more like the fail-safe because it relies on a user to go in and essentially start making an error uh, by going against the genomic risk, and then they, it, it, it corrects that error. But a lot of times there's preemptive actions, so you never reach those conditions. Yeah, I do think it's useful to, as I think people are coalescing around, is to think about some fairly different use cases. So, you know, one is the real-time alert. You're ordering a drug, you didn't realize there's genetic information there, and it tees up for you the fact that the patient has got a risk allele for adverse event related to that drug, and that's sort of real-time. But then there's scenarios where you, the knowledge updates. So you already ordered a test, your patient has a variant, but then there's evolving knowledge surrounding that variant that may be either put into a system that is accessible to the physician or maybe actually proactively delivered. Um, and then also support for family members, which is something that's somewhat unique. And we've dealt with, we've had this really challenging situation where, um, a, you know, a proband comes in, has a variant, 10 family members get testing, half of them are negative, half of them are positive. Later we realize the variant is benign and now we need to update. Well, the only people that get up updates are the people who had the variant, whereas the other half of the family that didn't have the variant 
and we're told they were risk-free, they need to be updated too and they don't have the variant. So there needs to be a notion that these people have been tested for this variant and we're told something different and don't, you know, like, and, and the physicians want us to tell them all that who's related to who, but that information didn't come through the physician, it came from other sources. We're not allowed to say who's related to who in the EHR. So that's an entirely challenging situation we have to deal with. And then we move over to our somatic cancer oncologists that we've been supporting, and they don't want us to even tell them what the variant means. They just want a system they can query, find all their patients with the variant, and look at their outcomes. So they want the clinical decision support tool that is a query-based system. So you know, I think it would be really useful to sort of bucket these very different use cases before we get to the point of sort of you know, talking deeply about workflow. I get to have a completely different clinical perspective on challenges that were are going to be um, huge. So for, we recently pulled the CSER and Emerge Working Group, um, uh, uh, EHR Working Group members to see how genetic information currently enters the, the um, EMR. And um, we're, we're some, some people were surprised, others not so surprised that, that it comes to the EHR through various different pathways, and that almost all of the decision support that's going on right now is on a very limited set of genetic information that comes in through the laboratory that's associated with the hospital that's providing the decision support, whereas quite a large amount, if not the majority of genetic information at most institutions comes from external, hospital, uh, external laboratories, reference laboratories, boutique testing laboratories, and it came up um, in the last session that you know, testing might even come from a patient um, the directed order, um, the, the, the direct to consumer um, test. And that um, as, as a laboratory, um, as we're challenged to enter this information into the medical record, we're limited by how the information is provided to us. And so if the external laboratory provides a PDF, that's all we can put in the electronic health record. And occasionally we try to extract, and in very specific cases, we try to extract some coded information from those to be able to be used in downstream systems, but that's a very rare case, and it's extraordinarily labor intensive. And so that in order to, um, so, so, so the, the stand, their standards for data representation and for data transfer um, don't just need to um, be reflected in the electronic health records, but also need to be reflected in the laboratory information systems that, um, through which the information almost uniformly goes before it gets entered into the electronic health record. Sure. Um, I was just thinking the context at which it matters and, and what type, um, how CDS would fire depends on um, almost where we are in time. So. Today, almost all these results are ones where we would order and we have to wait to get a result back. And then, and, and we've already moved forward with a current care plan and then have to modify our care plan, which necessitates things like um, ways to surveil a population and when a result comes back to be able to, you know, retrospectively act upon it, which is not necessarily done most efficiently through the physician. But if you, you know, push forward to a, a CDS becomes the first line of defense if the data is just embedded there. So, so, so um, uh, in a future where you have all the relevant variants where you need and knowledge comes available, then a lot of times you do the right thing the first time probably only beca because of the CDS um, instead of uh, uh, being kind of a last line of defense. So one of the questions was at least what forms of CDS uh, one might be aiming at. I think adjusted dosing would be one great example of where it's seamless and it's it's actionable and it may have a one-line header that explains why it's got adjusted dosing but it, it wouldn't be a po separate pop-up alert um i at least at the hospital i work at i i don't have the strong sense it's time for this yet we, we as I think it was said, 90% of genetic tests are, are sort of targeted and they're looking for something in particular. Um, 
I think we've got a number of years before it's rampant, but I think we need in the, re my guess is it needs to be in the research context. We need to figure out how to do it right. And along the lines of some previous comments, I think establishing standards for what are reasonable triggers and what are reasonable actions and what forms of actions uh, work best um, in a user-centered fashion. Um, so I'll qualify this start first by saying I'm not a clinician, so, um, but I've worked with um, some clinicians on our uh, pharmacogenomics implementation at Northwestern, so, um, but I do ask for clinicians to correct me if what I'm saying is totally off base. Uh, so one part that we found, at least as far as workflow, uh, where it, it, in retrospect, seems obvious is when the result actually shows up to the physician. And in some cases, this maybe isn't as relevant if the physician is the one who explicitly ordered a specific genetic test for something, but if they're doing uh, pre-screening for something, doing a panel, um, and just giving them back some type of results isn't enough. Uh, we anecdotally, you know, had a lot of physicians go, well, what does this mean? And, you know, and, and justifiably so, one thing that we learned was carefully crafting um, the wording in the message um, and, and the results that are coming back. But it's just, I just wanted to highlight that it's, it's a very important area of, of decision support to provide the information that's needed at that point in time um, when the result first comes back. It's, it's um, you know, in addition to when actions are taking place in, during the clinical encounter and then, and then more active alerts are being um, executed on. Um, and I think that also that another area, I'm not sure uh, how necessary this is, and again, this is where I'd ask the clinicians to, to provide input, um, but it, a, a lot of the stuff that I've heard from clinicians that I've worked with is, what do I do now? I want to know what I do now. Um, and if you need to send out for a lab test, um, you know, is their decision support that not only says you should order this lab test, but in the interim, while you're waiting for the lab test, here's the best course of action that you should reasonably take and, you know, and then expectations downstream. Yeah, I think those are really good points. And, and I, I did want to uh, comment that, uh, you know, uh, we are monitoring um, some of the Twitter feed and that particular idea, tell me what to do now in a very short, um, actionable message is a recurring theme that's appearing on our uh, Twitter comments, and, and I think it, it's something that we have experienced, um, and particularly in, in organizations that have a much longer experience with clinical decision support where there's an inherent trust in the knowledge management that there's much more willingness to act on uh, information that's presented um, uh, in that way. Um, I wanted to, um, let's see, I think we have, um, Alex, Ken, and Jeff in the queue. So I'm shifting gears a little, addressing uh, item number seven, which is dual purpose. Uh, so if these genomic databases are to support research, uh, they would have tremendous impact because of many, say, rare variants uh, being pointers to new uh, basic science research in, uh, you know, basic biology of relevance for human health. So if we are to accomplish that, then uh, the genomic module, if you wish, that stores this data will have to evolve actually at a different pace and expose the data in ways which are not necessarily serving, uh, you know, clinical decision making, but serve that other purpose. Now, if we assume that that's, that module is there, then the question is how does it interface with the clinical decision support system, EHR? you know, limbs, certainly there'll be two branches from a limbs, one into EHR for more established tests, another into this genomics module. But the question is, will CDS also take only a portion of data or, uh, or not? Uh, well, the answer is probably only a very small portion of it. But the question is, how do these components interface with each other? And this is where the standards may come in and need to be defined. What are the interfaces, what are the data exchange formats between the genomics module, EHR, CDS, and LIMS? So I was struck by a comment that uh, basically a lot of stuff is simply not ready for prime time yet. And I think that in fact probably is true. Um, so when we think about what do we need to scale, we can, I think we need to start from the ground up and say, well, first we need the clinical evidence that treating patients in a certain way makes 
is actually good. And I, I think we need that. Um, and then we need next, even if it's not scalable, just when we implemented this kind of system at our institution, these are the positive impacts we found. And I think we're starting to see some of that, but I, I think that's important. There, that's a kind of a separate research track saying, don't worry about scalability, figure out a good way to make it work in a workflow and see if it makes a difference. That's clearly needed. If you think back to general decision support, I mean, there was a randomized control trial by Clem McDonald showing that back in 76 in the New England Journal of Medicine, right? So, like, we need that before we can say, how do we scale it? And then, of course, we need to work on the scaling issue, but I think sometimes we tend to uh, leapfrog a little bit, and I think we need to first start by creating very definitive evidence that caring for patients using these approaches makes sense, because what you're competing against in an operational setting is for interventions where it's been shown for years that that's the, that improves uh, best care, and then uh, sh showing how you can do this in a scalable manner. So uh, I thought Ken and Casey's opening question to the providers was really important to try to understand what the customer needs are, the customer being the providers. And we heard some great also heter and heterogeneous responses from some clinicians in the room, but I would argue we may not have sufficient data on what the customers really are looking for. Maybe uh, EMR vendors do, and, 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 they, and uh, maybe JD can comment on that. But uh, through Ignite, Emerge, and Caesar, uh, I know Ignite has several hundred providers or enrolled as subjects in the clinical trials, particularly for the implementation components of <coughs> genomic medicine. And I imagine Caesar and Emerge also have providers enrolled, and I would at least suggest that we uh, use that as a resource of uh, providers that are in di diverse geographic, demographic, and also specialty, non-specialty environments uh, in underserved as well as academic medical centers and really see if we can craft that landscape of how uh, providers are really thinking about the uh, utility of clinical decision support and how it fits into their workflow. Um, sort of a related thought. One of the things I think we don't have yet really in this space is kind of a fundamental understanding of the epidemiology of, of the baseline, if you will. What are the characteristics of genetic test ordering, if you will, across the board, because it's still very early. In the CPOE world years ago, we had good evidence about ADEs and drug interactions, and we were able to there, thereby clearly demonstrate the impact of uh, CPOE on adverse drug events. So one of the things we might want to do is to get some epidemiology on how test ordering is occurring, and again, not my field, maybe it's great, but um, you know, to understand what's happening in the wild, if you will, so that we can then look at interventions and see their impact. Yeah, and um, I th that's a point that we had a bit of a sidebar conversation uh, uh, um, about uh, David and I. Um, uh, that this is an issue, and, and uh, we, we have somebody from Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, Tech, but um, uh, in the context of one of the other genomic medicine working group meetings, which was a payer-focused meeting, there was a subgroup that uh, went on to do some work looking at, um, you know, the, the role of physician education in the genetic test ordering, because uh, there there's empiric evidence that shows that there's a lot of problems there. And there's been a recent paper um, by Chris Miller out of ARUP that looked at if you put a genetic counselor uh, at the front end for molecular test orders, you know, how much redirection of testing would take place. And they found, you know, in, w w in a relatively large referral laboratory setting, that there were a lot of orders that were redone and that the, the savings uh, to someone uh, was in the range of thirty to sixty thousand dollars a month. Now, actually, while they use the term savings, the reality of that was uh, coming out of ARUP's bottom line because had they just simply run the test, they would have gotten paid for it, even though it was a wrong test for the wrong indication. So, uh, in some ways, as you look at that, you say it's very nice of them uh, to be altruistic, but I don't think that that's a generalizable principle across all laboratories um, uh, that they would behave that way. But then it raises the question that Tool brought up, which is to say, is is there a role for decision support as a guide to ordering more traditional genetic testing? And if we think about it from the point of uh, return on investment, we actually have data uh, that we could say, here's the impact. Now, perhaps a solution to the problem other than having a genetic counselor review every laboratory, molecular laboratory test that goes over is that we could set this as a task for clinical decision support 
to somehow address and, and potentially uh, solve at least at some level. And so I think we can decide whether or not that would fit within the, uh, what we're talking about, but I think there's at least some, uh, there's a clearer return on investment with some evidence relating to that epidemiology that, you're, that you speak of. And, and so if you want to uh, add to that based on the, the tax experience. Sure. So I, I'd say looking at what's happening with ordering genetic tests is incredibly difficult to do, even for a system like the Blues, um, which in part is due to how genetic tests are coded, right? So um, claims data is only as good as uh, what gets put in there, and so um, our inability to really differentiate between tests at a, at a claim level is quite problematic when we want to see how things are, are being ordered. But I think even when you speak to uh, laboratories now who are running tests, they, they speak uh, of sort of those same massive amounts of savings, uh, particularly in the oncology space where you can put together very clear uh, decision tools uh, because the rules are more clear uh, in that environment than, than they may be in some others. And um, I think certainly large academic institutions that have, that have instituted some of that have, have seen some large savings. I think um, for us, too, we're, you know, we do a lot of uh, evidentiary assessment uh, in, in my group, and we put together a lot of decision support tools and actually have a meeting next week where we're showing some of these decision support tools, particularly in the genetic space. Now, the way we use them is, is different um, than the way they're being discussed here, but I think that there are some synergies, and I think understanding how, uh, you know, plans and, and payers use decision support tools in their businesses to, you know, lo look at claims both in a, in a pre-approval space and uh, in an adjudication space is important. Um, because they are being used on a daily basis, obviously not only in, in genetics but in other areas as well. Um, so I, I just want to make one point, which is, you know, in, in the workflow, we've, we've kind of focused heavily on the clinician. I, I think there's a piece of it that we discuss, um, which is the patient aspect of it. Especially, especially when we discover new variants and, and there's a time lag of, of years, right? And so how do we contact the patient back? And that, that becomes a challenge when we think about um, not understanding who the attending physician is at that point in time. The patient might not be um, scheduled for something as an encounter with, with the inpatient side. So I think, you know, one of the things that we were discussing or looking at is how do we actually inform the patient since that's the constant factor and, and, and then have the patient actually um, contact a provider for follow-up. Um, our, our current EHR system and even our, our current processes aren't really very much um, set up to do those kinds of things. So, so that is, you know, perhaps one of the barriers, um, you know, for, for CDS. So I analyzed that data for Chris Miller when I was at ARUP. And so I had a little, a little more in-depth look at how they did that um, decision support of, of letting clinicians know that, that their tests weren't being ordered appropriately. And it was highly labor intensive and involved calling clinicians back and finding out their exact um, pedigree. So I'm not sure if that's, um, I'm not sure if that's automatable. Um, uh, and, I, and I think that, that it illustrates that one of the opportunities and also one of the challenges of, of, of much of the genomic clinical decision support is that oftentimes these are rare tests that need in-depth understanding. Um, and so um, you know, one of the opportunities is to develop decision support um, infrastructure where there can be multiple inputs from multiple people at different institutions and it can also be shared across institutions. Um, and it's also one of the challenges. Um, at our institution, we, we tried to roll out um, clinical decision work for pharmacogenetics on a very small level. We found that, that our larger concern was not about alert fatigue, but about alert shock. That, you know, this is the first decision. That Luke, Luke Rasmussen commented on this as well. It's the, if it's the first time that a clinician sees something, and maybe the only time they're going to see it in two or three years, then they need more information about exactly what to do and exactly how to handle that. And um, we were at discussing it from a research perspective, is uh, our end going to be large enough to be 
um, provide meaningful results, but it could also be seen from a cost issue as well. Is are the um, uh, uh, is the yield on um, providing a, a, some type of clinical decision support that's only going to influence one or two people every year um, large enough that it justifies the resources necessary to create that clinical decision support flag? And on an institution level, the answer is going to be absolutely no. Um, if that is shared for rare rare situations across multiple institutions, then, then perhaps the answer will be yes, it is justified and, and, and cost effective. Yeah, I, th I think the points uh, with AREP are, are, uh, are well taken, although I think there are some, again, uh, there are variations. I mean, there are uh, ones that are just dead simple, like we've done this test before. It's a genetic test. We don't need to do it again. And Bob and I have both been involved looking at our own institutions and duplicate genetic testing. Uh, and it's particularly interesting if you have a genome and then somebody orders a specific gene test, whether, you know, the, the approach would be different. So uh, with that being said, I think there, there are some things that could still be uh, approachable. But you're, you're right. For many of them, it did require a lot of intensivity. And it gets to the point that uh, was being brought up by Kurt earlier, which is, you know, part of the problem is how much information is the clinician willing to supply along with the la laboratory request, which I know is a daily problem for Heidi. And, and, and the reality is, is that when we really look at the workflow, it's the clerk or the receptionist that's filling out the requisition. Uh, it's not the physician that's doing it. So there are a lot of those issues. So I have Robert, Paul, and Ken. So I think it's interesting. One of the themes that uh, that we've been on here for a few minutes is this concept of, of when genetic tests are being ordered. But, uh, you know, the other side of that coin is a preemptive model where the genetic test is ordered once preemptively. Uh, and over time, it is not the, the, what we would consider the traditional genetic test, the sequencing that's being done, that's being ordered and done again. It's the, it's the interpretation that's ordered. And so one of the things that we may want to consider here is how that model changes. You order the test, the physical part is done once, and what the clinician actually does is order the interpretation. Um, reg regarding the question of trying to prevent the clinician to erroneously order the $1,000 test instead of the $20, we've done that with HIV tests for quite a long time. so that. The expensive ones were being ordered frequently, and what we did at our institution was change the orderable name to HIV routine test, and suddenly it sort of went up. Um, <laughs> yeah, and our our institution would, if if we were confronted with this, we would put it into the work ordering workflow so that you wouldn't be able to order these expensive tests without answering a few coded questions that we could go by. And I think, I forget if it's LDS or Intermountain or somebody had had some good antibiotics decision support tools that really showed quite a bit of difference. Yeah, and I think that, you know, this gets to a, a, a piece that seems to me emerging from the discussion is that, you know, CDS is not equivalent to alerts. And that, you know, one of the areas to explore within the genomic CDS realm is, what are the different ways of doing it? And in the ARUP experience, I know that there were several others that you did address by the very simple thing of changing the name so it looked different from the test that was being misordered. Well, that's something that it's not interruptive. It's just, you know, it's just helping to build the guidelines so that people do the right thing. And it's, then it's really not even a workflow issue. Uh, it's just, you know, um, you know, providing, it's like your ATM not accepting pulling your card in so you'll leave it. It's you have to take it right out again. So um, th th that uh, seems to be an area where uh, we, we may want to, um, uh, to focus. So uh, I had Ken next, uh, and, and do you want to interrupt, Terry? Uh, you're yeah, paying for this, so I'll let you. No, 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 I'm not. I'm not it's the people are paying, so the people can, can interrupt. No, I just wanted to just specifically on that point, it, it harkens back to what the, one of the points Dan made earlier this morning, that, you know, you can put in a simple mechanical change like having somebody put their hand on the, on the pilot's Hand. And, and this seems almost the same way, that, you know, you just, just change the name and say, here, order this one, and people will do it. So there's been a lot of discussion today about closing the loop and evaluating, and I, I think that's really important. I mean, operationally, it's so common that you implement a clinical distance board or some intervention, 
and you never end up evaluating whether it actually made a difference. Uh, it just the way it is, because people perceive a problem, you implement something, you never actually find out whether it had an impact. Um, I think a big part of what we should be doing is measuring from the beginning, setting up these epidemi epidemiology or problem assessment, uh, and know what the problem it is that we're actually trying to solve, because that will f by itself solve the ROI issue, because we'll be able to tell whether it actually is worth implementing these systems. I wanted to um, return uh, to the patient uh, for, for period of time, so since we have that listed out there, and we talked about a couple of different roles um, uh, for the patient. Uh, one is, um, you know, how much patient-entered information uh, could we rely on in terms of uh, developing structured data that could be used so we're not solely dependent on providers to put that data in. Um, another one that I heard was using, you know, since the patient is the constant, how might we be able to use the patient to return new knowledge as opposed to dealing with the ch challenge of, well, who's the physician and who's responsible and how do we track them down? But another aspect that I think is interesting, and, and it reflects a definition that many of you have heard me use in talks about what personalized medicine really is, and, and the definition that I, that I use is the one that Steve Pauker and Jerome Kassir put forward in a paper in 1987 where they say uh, that, you know, um, personalized medicine uh, relies on uh, understanding what the patient desires the most from their therapy, what they fear the most, on the basis of as much information as is available. And the thing that I like about that definition is that, it's, first of all, it's patient-centered. It puts the uh, impetus on us to, to really understand what it is our patients hope to accomplish with their interaction with the healthcare system and with the treatment. Um, but also, it does not promote any given type of knowledge above any other. And so, uh, you know, again, somewhat heretical for me as a geneticist to not promulgate a definition of personalized medicine that doesn't have genetics or genomics in it. But nonetheless, I think that they really nailed it. And so the, the point I'm making here is, uh, the, 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 and the area that we haven't uh, really explored yet, is if we talk about clinical decision support, we think about, you know, doing, you know, a certain thing based on a certain set of information. But if the patient has a different perspective on what they want to accomplish, then that could influence the message. And Jeff and I have talked about this in the context of family history, and this is something that we built into the uh, tool at Intermountain uh, that we uh, built with Nathan is that we collect all the information, we can run risk algorithms based on the information that the patient enters to identify where do we think, you know, the money would be in terms of doing that. But as we thought about it more, we said, well, what we really need to do is add one more question, which is now that you've entered your family history, what are you worried about? Or what, what, what is most interesting to you? Because that then, you know, sort of pre-negotiates uh, what should be talked about with the clinician. So as opposed to saying, you know, launching in and saying, well, based on your family history that you entered, you know, you've got this risk for cardiovascular disease, when they're really worried about the fact that their father was just diagnosed with colorectal cancer, you know, we, uh, we can, you know, really meet them where they're at, and we might be able to sell some of the same sort of prevention method, uh, uh, messages, but in the context of something that they're currently interested in as opposed to something that we may be interested in. And so I just put that out there as an idea to say, you know, how might we encompass that within the discussion of genomic CDS? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, I think this is where patient portals can really help augment some of this. Uh, when we talk about incidental findings, I mean, this, this really is pointed right to the patient because when we do genetic testing, of course, we will find other indications other than the test for what the test was ordered for. Uh, you know, I think we really have to have in opt-in, in, opt opt-out uh, methodologies for the patient where if, you know, we do genetic testing, we can actually determine through a pick list what a patient wants to know and what a patient doesn't want to know. Uh, you know, even with some very uh, horrific diseases like Huntington's disease, uh, you have certain family members, even though it's known to be within the family, that just do not want to know until they start, you know, having symptoms of the disease. And so having this type of, I, I don't want to go as far as a consent, because I don't think we really need to consent people for this, but having them have the options through a patient portal that interlinks with the EMR, I think would be very valuable for the patients, and I think it's something they would like. 
And um, also related to that, so um, in thinking about what the patient might want, thinking of broader ways to, uh, of um, implementing decision support might be relevant also. So um, you mentioned the patient portal, but also if there are a way to uh, text message uh, information. And so thinking more broadly in, in different ways to um, in, uh, involve the, the patient in, in getting information and educational materials or what have you. I, I think that's spot on. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, we've talked a lot about traditional computing systems. We really haven't talked about mobile computing and how that's going to affect the whole clinical decision support. So I think that's extremely important. Uh, it, you know, I just think that, you know, the patients seem to be want, want to be more involved with their health care decisions today than they were, say, 20 or even 30 years ago. And so uh, I think it's really important. But we have to be very cognizant of the type of information that we flow in a clinical decision support to a physician or a geneticist or a molecular biologist and helping make decisions about what patient care would be has to be very different if we're going to present this same type of information to the patient because they are not, they tend not to be as sophisticated, not saying all patients aren't, but certainly there is a different level when you're talking about third or fifth grade, fifth grade reading levels for the majority of our patient, or our, yeah, patient population we really have to think differently about how we present this type of data. Yeah, although the, um, uh, to pre present a bit of a countervailing um, argument there, uh, we have some preliminary data that we're further exploring that indicates that our physicians prefer the patient uh, uh, level material uh, related to this than something that, that we build for them because it's at a, at a much more understandable level. So I think we may, we may be meeting in the, uh, somewhere, but it may be closer to the patient side than on the, on the provider side. So we'll, uh, more to come on that within the next year or so. Yeah, so. Uh, again, totally agree. And when I talk to physicians, I hear one thing pretty much all the time, and that's KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. So I, I second the, uh, the notion of using the patient portal, and this is not necessarily specific to genomic medicine. You know, we ask patients through the portal about readiness to change uh, when it comes to certain lifestyle and behavioral um, uh, sort of paradigms we might, might be recommending for them. But I just wanted to highlight, at least in our family history uh, program, when a clinical decision support rule fires on the family history data, it sends a report to the provider, which is written in a certain, certain language for the provider, but it simultaneously sends a report to the patient that um, at least indicates that they may be at risk for something and to have them ask their physician. So it's to, meant to engage and motivate. Uh, so whether that can be uh, adopted more ubiquitously to other CDS paradigms, I mean, I can certainly imagine some patients might want to know that they've been recommended a drug and why that drug was recommended to them. Perhaps there's also language that could be um, used for a patient-centered or patient-facing report about why their doctor has selected this drug and if they have any questions to talk to their doctor. So it really kind of engages them and may even get to your question about what, what patients' preferences might be. Yeah, and we have um, certainly in some of the projects like Open Notes and that sort of thing, uh, when we've looked at, you know, alerting the, uh, and opening uh, the electronic health record more uh, fully to uh, to patients, you know, that their, you know, the, the simultaneity of it, they want the result when the clinician gets the result and, and to be actively engaged has been a recurring theme. So I think th that's a, you know, a very good approach to, uh, um, to go. I think can I, I've got... Can I add a code to that? Yes, you may. Because yep. actually one, uh, one study we did up in, in Boston looked at delivering a co-management module for diabetes to the patient. Uh, via the PHR, and it was something that was shared by the patient and shared in the EMR with the provider. And uh, interestingly, 75% of patients actually opened up the diabetes thing and did their work to create a journal. And 75% of physicians looked at what they were being submitted, what was being submitted. So the, the lesson actually was not only did that thing activate the patient, but it also activated the provider. Great. I had Paul first. Yeah. Um, the example was given of, of uh, caregivers of patients with dementia engaging with, with online sort of resources. At least those, those tend to be very distraught and also very motivated persons um, sort of looking for answers. It's far different for healthy, particularly young patients who haven't had too much uh, intersection with hospitals and that sort of thing. Um, 
I may just be oblivious, but I'm not aware of any proven widespread engagement for these healthy patients for portals. And if that's true, that would be a problem for a wide uh, family history collection. Two just small points. One is if, if there is a proven method or if there's engagement, I'd strongly recommend combining it with review of system, uh, smoking, depression, alcohol. Uh, family history would be just one more component. And the only thing that I'm, that I personally am motivated by is insurance premiums. So if, what I, if they want me to fill something out, they tell me I'll get $20 off a month if I do it. So um, to address the question, um, uh, in, in the family history tool that we built at Intermountain, we d did in fact collect some of that the specific review of systems information. Nathan, I know we've done a lot of analytics on the patients that have actually completed that. We, I think we have several thousand that have uh, entered data. Do we have any information related to the characteristics of those patients related to disease burden and that sort of thing? Uh, uh, overall, I think you could probably characterize them as predominantly female average age in their 30s. Um, it would be interesting to understand the specific clinical reasons that drive them there. Uh, but in terms of, of, of engagement, you know, I think there's, there's various ways you can go. Some is to let the risk assessment or the capabilities themselves act as the reason for which you take the time to do it. And I think that it's likely that the review systems and the other data points that you've already brought up would naturally come in addition to the family history at that point. But, but I do think that in many cases, the decision support on top of that actually acts as the reason to take the time to do it to begin with. Adam, I had you next. So just wanted to uh, go back to what Jeff uh, and several others were talking about. And I, I don't think anybody in the room is from the VA um, if they are. So what I was going to suggest is it might be worth engaging with them. They, they have the blue button initiative, which allows VA um, uh, veterans to get their health information directly out of the VA, uh, connects the entirety of wherever their health data might be, whether it's from laboratories or hospitals or other outpatient services. So it's a, it's a neat system to be able to try and look at how patients directly engage with their data. And their 2013 updates to the system actually allow for self-reported data to be put into the system. So they're thinking about new ways to collect information from other sources and also how to actually engage patients. I, I would suggest maybe that might, might be a, a group to try and engage with in this conversation as well. Uh, you know if they've been um, uh, looking at that in the context of the, their Million Veteran Program? Is that something that they're looking for any synergies there? Uh, so the. And, and so I, I should qualify, I'm not from the VA, so, so I'm, not, I'm not talking on their behalf. Uh, my understanding of the MVP program is that it's completely research-based right now, so they're not connecting into the, cl the clinical side. Uh, I think their long-term strategic plans around it, though, are to try and move this into clinical practice. Um, so, but as of right now, my guess would be that there isn't that connection yet. Um, probably, like I said, long-term strategy. Uh, one thing I was just going to make a comment, I, I'm not aware of anything that's uh, addressing healthy populations, but another thing we might want to think about connecting into are things like the Indiana Health Study, where they are looking at healthy individuals and how they're actually interacting with the environment, and it's a fully integrated with their electronic health records. I don't know if they have a patient portal. I was trying to do a quick look before you called on me, but I didn't get quite that far. Uh, but it might be interesting to see if, th if places like those, those longitudinal studies that are, are, are actually trying to look at healthy populations or um, supposedly healthy populations, uh, see if they might be thinking about portals and how they're engaging. I mean, that might be a way to get some of the data that you're referring to. So, well, Just um, <clears throat> having the perspective of doing the year in review for uh, the most of a decade, the, it, it, the, the most robust literature, literature about this proactive engagement electronically with large groups is, has come out of uh, the large uh, West Coast HMOs, so Kaiser and Group Health. Um, and it is the case that they very proactively, once they know you have an electronic presence, they, they communicate with you a lot and give you lots of opportunity. And they have cell, smartphone apps and all that sort of thing um, for promote, pr promoting healthy behaviors. And they provide financial incentives for doing it. You, know, you can actually get a, a payment or a <clears throat> Starbucks credit, or you, know, you get to choose. <laughs> Uh, so I think that those um, partners for doing testing of personal genomic apps would be uh, 
a, a, a very uh, appealing opportunity for somebody. <laughs> and just to, to, to follow up on that thought, uh, I had the chance week before last to go out to Health 2.0. Uh, anyone else go out to that? It's sort of the startup conference of you know all new health apps, very uh, patient oriented, and half of the things were all about uh, patient engagement, patient activation, and one of the things that was just really prevalent was the idea of game of gamification of you know the patient engagement process. So if, if we can get you know sort of the family history tree gathering data application to play Donkey Kong or something, you know <laughs> it's going to work. <laughs> Pong in my case, probably, but uh, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm curious. That there are a couple of examples. I know that um, uh, Illumina, and, and I don't know if any, if anybody in the, in the room may have answers to this, but I'll just put it out there. So um, Illumina has uh, returned sequence results to individuals, and I think that's also been done, at least in a limited uh, fashion, uh, with um, oh shoot, I'm, I'm blocking on the, uh, the other. Um, It'll come to me. Um, have there been has there been any published results about anything related to how people are interacting with their genomes? I've seen some stuff related to 23andMe, but uh, but not much else in that space. Is any, anybody aware of that? Uh, nothing dispassionate and analytical. It all seems to be promotional of the 23andMe or stripe, inflammatory. or inflammatory is <laughs> reactionary. been talking a lot about um, what distance sports should look like and how we should engage patients. I was wondering if we can transition a little bit and talk about assuming that we will come up with the evidence and the knowledge base, because I, unless we believed it, we wouldn't be here, that, you know, genetic and genomic information is going to really be tremendous help to caring for patients and caring for ourselves. Assuming that's, that's going to happen, I, I, I think it's, it behooves us to think, what are the mechanisms to scale this? Um, how, how practically can we set up infrastructure that once we have that really clear clinical evidence that this is how you should care for patients and this is how you should be using genetic testing, that that can be scaled out widely because we all know that the likely path is that'll happen and maybe 20 years later, 30 percent of clinics will be doing it, that kind of thing. Um, so maybe I, I just wanted to see if we can transition a little bit to talking some more about that topic. I, I guess I just react a little bit to the sequence of events that you, uh, the way you described it, and that I would argue that having CDS is going to be a critical part of the strategy <laughs> for building the evidence. So I, our, I'm sure this is. Um, everybody's experience, but many clinicians don't even know how to access a lot of the genetic tests we're trying to evaluate. So the CDS regime would allow for individuals to know that tests are available that might be useful for a patient with, their, with certain predefined characteristics, and that might be um, very important for streamlining and making more efficacious our ability to do uh, pragmatic clinical trials, which I think are going to be at least one important component of building the evidence base for genetics and genomics. And just a, a little bit along those lines, um, I know one discussion that comes up a lot is, uh, do we do this in a research setting versus as a quality improvement type of project? If um, and just curious about the uh, experiences that, that folks have and opinions about that kind of process. So yeah, so. Uh, the problem with research grade data is the fact that you can't act on it clinically. And so then you are put in a position where if you identify, say, a somatic mutation in the BRAF gene for a mel melanoma patient, you literally have to go back to the paraffin block and order a CLIA certified test that tests for the same thing. It may be next generation sequencing, it may be a PCR test. So I, th I think, you know, research data has a lot of utility. Uh, especially when trying to make decisions about what are going to be the clinical decision uh, support mechanisms that we can put in place. But when, I, when you look at this and look at the duplication of data that you have to generate when you have just research grade data, I think it really puts us in a place where we have to look at if we're going to generate a genome for someone, let's spend the extra bucks and do it in a CLIA certified laboratory. 
uh, so that we actually can do, be actionable with the data that we have available to us. I mean, we ran into this, you know, numerous times when we were trying to uh, do patient trial matching for clinical trials or actually trying to, to put people on therapeutics when we saw that they had, you know, an EGFR mutation, a BRAF mutation, the such. It, we actually delayed the treatment because we had to go through the CLIA certification process. So I think that probably the answer is to do both uh, because uh, with QI type studies you can achieve a certain scale that uh, is more expensive or more difficult to achieve with uh, consensual research. Um, by, by the same token, sometimes you don't get, uh, particularly downstream, all the outcome information that you might want and uh, unless you're in a, a, the kind of environment where that, all that information flows electronically into the right place, um, then you're um, you're limited in what you can do if you don't consent the patient up front. Um, there's, um, there's certainly room to uh, do consentive research and run a CLIA certified test um, and then look for outcomes. That's, sort of, that's one of the directions I, um, that uh, some of the consortium are going to. Um, similar to our dependency on the timing of when rampant genotyping will occur, it, it, the only proven model that I'm aware of for scaling it in health IT related to research environments, academic environments, showing models of CDS and EHRs and all that, followed by meaningful use. And that's when it really exponentially started picking up. So the question comes up, it, we may never get stimulus again, but there may be penalties when MU4 and MU5 and MU6 come along, and that's probably, uh, it seems likely that's when it would really pick up. Well, I'll note that, I mean, a lot of these efforts, ONC and CMS are funding, it's obviously because they want to have something they can point to in regulation moving forward. I would caution, though, that it's, I have working on these things, it's very dangerous to be building standards to say, oh, once the EHR vendors are required to do this, everything will be fine because that you're basically saying nobody would use these standards on these unless they were required. So it's a bit of a chicken versus the egg thing, but I think granted those can be incentives, but we really need to make sure we build standards that people would implement regardless of whether they were required. To follow on that, and maybe JD will jump into the. Uh, I think if it's functionality that exists in the current platforms, then that's viable. But I think in terms of what what drives the development prioritization in the commercial sector is the regulatory compliance, and so that will bump things up to the top of the list if there's modifications needed to to reach those ideal workflows. So. Um, so I think, I, think, I think it works both ways. The other thing that I think can help drive a lot of this is gains and efficiencies to make clients faster and more optimized because right now the big discussion is around value. How does a healthcare system get faster? How does a healthcare system save money, end up with, without having never events, et cetera? And so that's really another one of the drivers. Like Mark said, you put a regulation out there, it's going to happen. Next thing is we've got changes in economics that are going to drive this for a variety of reasons independent of the growth of molecular testing that'll push things in this direction. The clients are already asking for it because they, they see the waste. And I think because they see the waste because the money's gone down. And so now what wasn't a problem because you had excesses in cash flow now is a problem because you don't. So that's the other big driver out there that'll help push this forward. Yeah, and I mean, frankly, we used to get reimbursed for waste, so, uh, right. uh, and that's changing as well, so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, but I think that does come back to the concept that you introduced at the beginning in, in teeing up this uh, section is, you know, where is the return on investment? What is the, you know, w w what sort of a story can we tell? And I think we've heard several different mm -hmm. uh, ideas about that. You know, one of the questions that I would put forward is that that's clearly a very important uh, thing to do, and uh, I know that, um, Genome has been uh, becoming increasingly interested in some of the economic aspects relating to uh, what it is uh, that we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so is that something that we could potentially, you know, create 
an agenda, a research agenda around in terms of understanding what really is, whether it's on, you know through policy or, or something of that nature. Yeah, one follow-on question could be more to Suzanne from where she sits with Blue Cross. Do we start to look at the driver of getting a patient's genome being sequenced, not initially done out of some disease state, but as an overall assessment of risk? as a patient moves into an ACO environment or comes into new healthcare policy, say, okay, I need to know who and what you are, and then I'll figure out what your, now granted, that brings up a whole host of issues with Gina and all that other kind of stuff, but you look at it in terms of that is truly a benchmark to figure out what kind of risk does this patient have both for disease and for health. I think you're right that it raises all sorts of issues, and, and, and so I won't go there, but, but I will say that as I've been listening to the conversation, mm -hmm. these are sort of some of the notes that, that I've been taking. Uh, you know, so as, as I hear people say, well, of course we're going to do this for the whole genome, my notes are, well, who initiates the test, right? right. So I, I've been, those are sort of the notes that, I'm, that mm -hmm. I'm walking away from because I think it is a paradigm shift, obviously, and for us. Um, in the way that we review evidence, we have to sort of think in, a, in another mm -hmm. realm. So I appreciate you bringing that yeah. up. Yeah, and, and just to harken back to something I said earlier, you know, uh, one of the presumptions I think, you know, for what we're talking about here is um, that we're relatively, that, we'll, that we assume the existence of a genome, uh, you know, that's within or touches the clinical uh, activities in some way, shape, or form. We're agnostic as to how that genome came to us. But I think we're all in agreement that if a genome is available, then it behooves us to, you know, beat the hell out of it to get as much value uh, as we can while minimizing the potential harm from misuse of information that we don't understand completely, you know, uh, what happened. So, uh, you know, I think we, we could also argue the point that perhaps clinical decision support could be used in certain scenarios to say, when you should do a genome as opposed to, and I think we heard uh, uh, some examples where, uh, you know, rather than in the laboratory setting, rather than doing, you know, a bunch of single gene tests, it makes sense to do a genome. And I think economically we understand that in certain scenarios that occur not infrequently, like a newborn screening, when you have a kid that fails newborn hearing or fails immunodeficiency, where you're talking about hundreds of genes that are potentially involved, you know, to me that seems to be a natural place where you might invoke a whole genome sequence to try and answer the question instead of going gene by gene by gene. But again, that we can decide whether we want to think about do we build decision support about ordering a genome as opposed to another test uh, as part of the discussion or whether we just want to focus more on the back end, which is we have a genome, how are we going to use it and how will decision support help? Ken. That's a question for that. Does anybody know what the cost of a newborn screen is versus the projected cost of a whole genome sequence? You say newborn screening, you mean typical? Or what, what people can say is we're just going to have to be doing this anyway. I, I, I guess what I'm getting at is when the cost becomes comparable enough, you could easily justify we're doing this anyway, why not do the more yeah. comprehensive test? Yeah. I, that raises an interesting set of questions, and, and I've been thinking about this quite a bit. From my perspective, I think that um, we can't look at, we, we won't look at sequencing as supplanting traditional analyte-based newborn screening because I can't imagine people sitting around and parsing, you know, the sequence of the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene and trying to infer what the phenyl phenylalanine level is from what the gene tells us. You'll measure the phenotype, and I think, again, that gets into, you know, the dangerous waters of assuming that genetic and genomic information is always preferable to other information. I think if you can directly measure the phenotype, you can do it reliably and cheaply, then that's something that you want to do. Now, there may be genomic implications in the sense that if you have a certain mutation, then that could make you eligible for certain medications and a different a treatment approach to that. But I wouldn't see it as necessarily um, replacing. But to answer your question, I think the newborn screening costs at the present time range depending on the numbers that are being done between about 60 and $200 per patient. So, and maybe I could just comment that, that the, the question of what sequencing adds to the current, uh, you know, enzyme-based screening panels are, is, is the goal of, of Ensight, one of the goals of Ensight. So that's the, the newborn sequencing program that we're working on with an ICHD. So, so hopefully we'll have some kind of an answer to that at least. Uh, I just make the point that the 
company that runs newborn screening for the U.S., Park and Elmer. They actually have 100 percent of the business. So they've been looking into the dynamics of genetic testing, you know, on a state-by-state -state basis, and their, their conclusion was it has to be actionable. So for them to, to proceed, they've been looking at it for a couple of years, but it, it's not something they're kind of comfortable really pursuing right now, except for at-risk individuals. Also, the, 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 there are multiple levels at which the current billing system does not fit, and, and you, you say that, you know, sh how much does the genome cost? You know, you're, say, you're assuming there's an analyzed genome that appears, you know, first you're assuming that the cost is oftentimes quoted as reagent cost, but the analysis cost we all know is way more than the, the, the and then that analysis cost, you could say, well, can we have analysis as we go? We can have a physician order analysis, but there's no billing system to order analysis right now, and, and, and none, I don't, don't think, on the, on the horizon of somebody being able to say, can we order reanalysis or specific targeted analysis? Um, maybe, maybe someone can correct me if there is something in the pipeline. And um, then also the transfer of information from laboratory to, um, from laboratory to laboratory to whatever clinical, um, to, to whatever EHR, or from one EHR to another EHR. Um, is, is, is non-trivial, and, and there's also no mechanism for um, moving that information from one, inf one place to another place in a validated way so that we know that the, the information is, you know, lossless and um, transferred from one end to, yeah, I'll to the just, other. I'll uh, just do a here be dragons. Uh, <laughs> we definitely do not want to uh, go into the uh, uh, swamp of uh, uh, the problems with the reimbursement uh, and try and solve I that agree. issue. Uh, so uh, while we need to be cognizant of it, I, I don't think we want to necessarily spend a lot of time uh, discussing it. So I've got Liz and then David. Just a comment on the analysis costs. They're not, um, they're not a factor higher than the sequencing costs these days. They're actually about equivalent analysis costs have come down rapidly as well. So. I would argue against that, that, that um, a, a quick and dirty analysis that gives you an overarching, um, overarching representation of, of, of a few things about the genome can be done very rapidly, but a clinical level analysis for specific clinical questions um, is not as trivial. So I would say in our clinical setting where we do clinical interpretation of genomes, the cost for the sequencing component is probably about 5,000. The cost for the analysis component is less than that, and the cost for the interpretation phase is about 4,000. Yeah, and so again, I don't want to get into an argument about this because my, uh, my, my uh, uh, contention would be is that um, the costs we're talking about are uh, not relevant because in no cases do we have an agreement about what is a clinical grade sequence or a clinical grade interpretation. We're basing our costs on what we're doing, and that does not reflect the standard of care. And, and until we have a standard of care, we really can't do cost comparisons. So I'll just end that discussion with that definitive statement. And I know you disagree, but that's okay. But I'm going to bring another aspect in real quick, and I know you all know this, but, you know, because storage is on the list. I mean, when we're talking about one genome per person with everyone in the United States, we're literally talking about three times 10 to the 23rd bytes of data that we have to store. There's not enough storage in this world to even handle that. And then when you talk about the transportability of it, especially if we're talking whole genome sequencing, now all of a sudden our pipes have to be much larger and, you know, we're talking commodity internet or internet too. They basically are not going to be able to handle this data. So a lot of the pushback that I'm hearing from health systems and where I work is the fact that there is no reimbursement model that exist to pay a health system for the data storage, the internet connectivity, and all of that that they would have to adopt basically to bring in genomics as, as a technology for patient care. All you really need is a variant file, and that's about five yeah, megabytes. Right. So, so, I mean, size is not an issue. I disagree. I, I disagree. I think size is a huge issue because one of the things we were talking about earlier was reanalyzing the genome. Not for genome. CDS. I mean, for, but, for but decision if, support, you're not going to be sending a full raw variant. Or but if you're going to reanalyze the genome, all you need is variants. But if you're going to reanalyze the genome, because we heard earlier about, I don't want to order a new genomic test. I want to order a new analysis of that genome. Right, and you just look at the variants, really. I, I, mean, I just, I disagree. Okay. Because it's not just variants. It's, it's let me uh, let me in interject as referee here. I think again we're dealing with with 
we're, we're giving definitive answers for something for which a definitive answer doesn't. So we're having a faith-based argument here as opposed to a, an evidence-based argument because the reality is is that you know the variant files that we're currently looking at, um, for the most part, are uh, are being generated off of references that we treat as somehow a reference genome, but we don't understand what a reference genome really is, and so. Um, it, it, you know, there's a lot of this that's, st that's still evolving, um, but I think the, the, so the point is we don't know what the right answer is, although uh, I think, Dan, in your, uh, I think it's desiderata number one, it's the lossless data compression, and I don't know if that's relevant to bring up in this context. And, and that paper actually <clears throat> recommended a kind of digital subtraction lossless and recommended that if NIH would support a reference sequence, whatever it was, that in fact was just the Euclidean minimal distance between the variants you might observe, you, you could get something between one and two orders of magnitude of compression just because the genome's so repetitive and all, and all that sort of stuff. But I think uh, the countervailing view would be, well, e even if you rep represented it as ASCII bytes, it's still about one DVD of information <laughs> per, per person, right? DVDs still hold, hold about two gigabytes. And so it, it isn't uh, in the scale of, uh, of clinical data imaging studies, especially multiple um, slice uh, CD high, and high resolution MR, are already, PAC systems are in that range. So I think the physical storage, although it's not in place, is kind of not the showstopper, I think, in, in many people's view. Uh, but it would require some work, for sure, to make efficient ways of doing lossless compression. So, so to pull this back to the discussion that we're having around implementation, um, I, I think there are some relevant issues. And, and so I guess the question that I would ask related to uh, the issues of the uh, uh, amount of data and storage and portability, which have come up before, you know, what would be the things that, you know, would be potentially studyable within that space that would be within scope for this particular group to consider? Ken? One thing I'd propose is to just say there are approaches that have been proposed beyond um, genomic CDS really for potential inclusion in EHR certification criteria, meaningful use. CMS regulations, et cetera, that build on a lot of the work done by this community, but um, Blackboard's work, the CDS consortium, et cetera, but they're being proposed. There are pilots ongoing right now with vendors and with healthcare organizations, et cetera, to validate that these actually do work and that it is usable and appropriate potentially for later inclusion in reg federal regulations. I would say one very reasonable approach is to say, well, why don't we see and evaluate whether genomic CDS use cases can be covered by those identify issues and evaluate them, return back those conclusions. And at that point, there, there should be very strong alignment with the overall industry direction. And instead of, for example, potentially meaningful use being the reason why genomic CDS does not happen because EHR vendors and implementers and healthcare organizations are too focused on those, maybe it's a part of those um, sort of uh, trajectories. So, I would propose that as a very, I think, pragmatic approach to say, let's see the direction that, that the industry is going and see if it could meet the needs of genomic CDS and identify areas where it does not and try to get those fixed. So essentially uh, what might be constituted as a, or uh, represented as a gap analysis to say, let's take this, let's throw it up against what it can do, see what it can and can't do, is that Paper-based analysis and actually just doing it. Because that, so in, in, the, in the context of the pilots we consider for our federal activities, we don't consider paper-based exercises to be sufficient. We consider it only sufficient when you actually do it and see where the issues are because we will find issues. And um, so I, I think we do have to go beyond tabletop exercises and actually do it. Um, at least if I was trying to to focus on the problems at hand, you know, and I was putting together an RFA, I would focus on a consortium potentially, you know, uh, aiming for five groups or something like that so that we could fully test the standards that might underlie the CDS and the, where the data resides, et cetera. Um, it'd be terribly user-centered and workflow-centered because 
that's where the real problems with CDS are these days. Um, it might focus on the exact triggers, the exact actions, the user satisfaction with those triggers and actions, whether it fits into the workflow. Uh, might have formal user testing, uh, might work with color schemes, dosing adjustments, pushing of reports, and again, trying to figure out what is the model that doesn't seem to disrupt clinical workflow too much. So um, kind of related to what uh, Ken was saying, um, the approach that, th that I've been using locally is kind of a phased approach to, to implementation where you first see, okay, we have, we have this pilot study, what do we do based off of what we have currently in our systems? And then you have a, like a, a lessons learned or, uh, or a needs at the end of that phase, which you use to kind of to inform what, what uh, additional development you need to do, and it seems like that's a little bit of a um, pragmatic approach, and I don't know if others have uh, approaches that they're, that they're using for implementation. Be curious to hear those. I'll just add, I mean, it, like Casey says, it's not rocket science, right? So we have proposed approaches of doing things, we try it and see where where the issues are, and particularly the issues tend to come. Can you really do it where the knowledge creator side does, has no contact with the knowledge consumer side? Because anyone who's implemented distance support knows that oftentimes you will take advantage of the fact that you're playing both sides, that you are the healthcare system who's implementing it. You know in our system, this is how the labs are formatted, and here's what the genetic test results are. Oh, and we know that we actually have a good problem list and it's coded using SNOMED versus IC9, and we may take advantage of that. The real challenge when you try to scale it is how do you do it when you, you don't have intimate contact possible between the knowledge creator and the knowledge consumer because to scale, you cannot have those end-to-end uh, -end, uh, contacts. And so, for example, when we took order sets from the Zinx approach and put it into a standard format and translated it into a, a EHR vendor uh, format, a lot of the issues came up, like we don't have a national orderable catalog, so we need to have communication or we don't know if we mapped it correctly. So these are the kind of issues that I think if we just uh, have the question to begin with, and this is what we're doing in our pilots, to say if you really didn't have communication, could you really do this is, is the big question because if you have in a pilot setting, in a research setting, et cetera, if you, control, if you have the ability to contact both sides, of course you can generally make things work. The challenge is how do you do it when you're supposed to let this out and 2,000 sites implement it with minimal tech support? So let me ask a, a question uh, related to that, because it seems to me that you know these types of pragmatic um, uh, experiments uh, a lot of times take place in our institutions, and some of us may have a developmental environment that we can play around with this before we put it into production, and, and we all know how our production people get really testy mm -hmm. about uh, implementing something that crashes uh, production. Um, what would be the um, likelihood that uh, we could create uh, a, um, a general, uh, a developmental environment that would be accessible by, by multiple users that could be standards based and, the, and where you could throw a bunch of experiments at this and test out some of these things but not have to rely on institutional goodwill uh, and trust that you're not going to break things. Comment on that. Um, so part of my hat is I'm on the VA's National Knowledge Based Systems team, which is thinking about these issues and that team has uh, developed a sandbox for this. and. Um, uh, there's ongoing work to build this into a more robust system with syn synthetic data, et cetera. So there's already, people have thought about this issue because it is very hard to collaborate really in an environment where you, well, I can't give you my access to my EHR system because you're, you are not employed by my system kind of issue. And I think that would be a wonderful thing for NHRI to work on, which is a sandbox where this kind of innovation could happen. I was glad to see Jim Simino uh, raise his hand without me having to ask him to weigh in on this. So, well, I wish I had, then I could pretend I was paying attention, so. Um, now, I, I uh, if, you, if you 
find a link between your, or create a link between your EHR and info buttons, and you can convey the, the laboratory information in that context, then you can work outside the EHR environment to experiment with different kinds of information resources that you might bring. So open info button, for instance, once you have a link to that, then you can put in links to all sorts of things and, and see how they're impacting both uh, practitioners and patients. Well, let me ask a more pointed question, which would be, I mean, I think that that's certainly one solution, but I think what I'm hearing from a number of folks is that, you know, there's lots of different things that we could potentially um, uh, use to solve the problem, and that different solutions may be more, uh, um, would, may, may fit better with, with different use cases. So would there be, uh, and obviously I don't expect you to commit to this one way or the other, but I mean, is there a role for NCBI, um, you know, with or without conjunction with uh, genome to say, could we create a, um, uh, a, a certified EHR developmental environment where we could actually do research on these types of questions? Is that, would that be within the purview of what you would see the mission of NCBI doing? Well, I don't represent NCBI, so I'm, I guess I can say whatever I want. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't see them doing that, and I, you know, I think Don Lindbergh has said for years that the National Library of Medicine doesn't have a health record, and so I don't know if they would be uh, um, amenable to that. It's interesting, though, that uh, just downstairs from NCBI is Clem McDonald, and he's got a personal health record, which is very, it's definitely a place that could be um, something you could experiment with. Un unfortunately, he's not here right now, but he'll, I think he'll be back tomorrow. On, yeah, we could, uh, I could promise it, on his behalf. We could volunteer him for this. Right. Uh, so, so I think, you know, I, I, but I don't see the NCBI getting in that realm. They haven't uh, moved in that direction yet. I don't, I don't think Don Lindbergh would, he hasn't shown any interest in doing that, so. I don't know if it's under what organization it's under. I think the need is there and has been for decades, and we've had it for decades. It, it, similar, it'd be similar to the um, practice-based research network where there's a infrastructure in place and it's leveraged many times over many years for many things. Um, the electronic health record needs the ability to, in a test environment, test small types of things, whether it's color schemes or whether it's placed on the right or left or whatnot. And I don't think, I don't think the major vendors um, at this moment have that in place so that in a randomized fashion, we can test any aspect. And, and they're terribly busy with all their installs and stuff, but there has to be some sandbox and whether that's vendor driven or whether it's academic or both doesn't matter, but you got to be able to test nuances to the EHR to make progress. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that possibly a partner in this venture could be NCI. So they're looking at the TCGA data set and putting that up in a cloud uh, simply because of the massive size of it. And so partnering with them and actually using the data out of the TCGA may help with the genomics use cases that we would come up with. JD, can I can I put you on the spot and just get your perspective? Of course, on this? you can put me on the spot. <laughs> In terms of providing a sandbox, I think that's a wonderful idea. I think one of the things that we, as an HIT community, have to figure out is how to support this initiative because there's got to be some kind of common infrastructure around it, to where it's there will always be some type of even if you take Smart on Fire as example. I'm not saying that's that's the that could be the vehicle for this. It could not be the vehicle for this, but. You look at the way we work to get Smart on Fire applications integrated into our own EHR. There's still going to be some type of little bit of legwork like that that every EHR vendor has got to do. But if you put it in a spot to where it's, it's as plug and play as you can make it, yeah. it's a place where we can go and test. I think we've already got some help in this area. If you look at what IHE does with their connectathons, where various vendors come, they're trying to support a standard, they plug their stuff in, run a couple of demo scripts, prove, okay, yeah, I can push data from A to B and the lights go off, that's great. We can probably corral ourselves around something like that in terms of, okay, here's a sandbox, and it could be even be a virtual sandbox to where you've got some environments that are hosted by someplace, 
that just live on a code repo. You download the latest version, test against it, go to the connect phone, great, everyone's happy, as opposed to something that's a long-term durable, yes, we got a server that's running in the cloud on some HIPAA place, that kind of thing. But no, I think definitely we've got to move in that direction because floating around this is a need for not just a sandbox but also a toolkit, an SDK, if you will, to use programmer parlance. So I just want to echo this. You know, I think it is a great idea to create a separate environment. And in our experience a number of years ago trying to launch this within the partners EHR was it was just really, really difficult to work within that environment uh, and extraordinarily slow. And so we stepped outside and created a system that could interact with many different clinics and be a standalone system, URL-based, web-based. So any clinician, all they need is internet access. to. And we were concerned initially that if it wasn't you know, a single sign-on through a physician's EHR that they weren't going to use it. But as it turned out, if, if it's useful to the clinicians, they happily go to a, a, you know, a website and use it there. And so I think it speaks to the, the idea that this is a perfectly fine place to start, at least in my mind, is to create this separate, you know, environment. And I don't, you know, I think anyone who has the capability to support it could be the one who creates this uh, environment to support. And it could be, a, you know, not just a sandbox. It could actually be the clinical decision support environment that may function for some time until there's really a robust way to integrate it into the EHR systems that stand today. Before I get you, Jim Blackford, um, with CDSC, uh, was there any uh, attempts in this in in this area to, as you were working on interoperability of CDS? <clears throat> Not in terms of a sandbox. We actually found willing uh, victims slash partners, <laughs> and uh, working with those vendors in Regan Street, you know, we were able to to find the the knowledge transaction, the data transaction, um, in a pseudo standards based way. Okay. I was just going to say that it seems like I two B two might be a, an environment where you could. Uh, do a lot of experimentation. So I'll just note that the VA sandbox does actually have a Vista implementation. So it is with an open source EHR. Obviously, with it has to be open source. I mean, it would be difficult for a vendor to just say, "Here's our code for anybody in an open sandbox." But um, I think there's a lot of potential there, and there's uh, efforts to expand it. What I've learned just working in the open source community is there's a lot of demand for these kind of things. It's just very hard to fund. So for we get a lot of requests along these lines of can you make it easier for us to use, test out, can you have a sandbox environment? And what it ends up being is it's very hard to fund unless there's a group willing to do it. So I, I love the idea of a sandbox. I, I'm just trying to think from a practical stand, uh, you know, point of view about this. Is, is the end goal with such a thing just to be able to test it out in an environment or to test it out in such a way that we can make these decision support rules more broadly implemented and distributed? Um, to, to Dr. Semino's point about I2B2 as a potential platform, that, that's a good idea in that it also plugs into, uh, you know, it's smart enabled and would plug into what JD had described with, with Cerner's capabilities. So I'm, I'm not trying to put down the idea of it. I'm, I, I guess I'm just kind of curious if, if the end goal is, you know, do, do we really have, are we really trying to see every, how this decision support rule is going to work in every EHR vendor? Because given that certain vendors don't even let us show static screenshots, you know, without permission, get it, you know, getting access to, um, and I'm not talking about JD. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it just, it, just from a practical standpoint, it, it, it point of view, it's, it seems like it, it might be more wish than practicality, although there are other open source alternatives which, which are worth exploring. Ken may have the same thought, but you know, in, in some ways, there's lots of different ways to cut this piece of cake. You don't necessarily have to have a common, you know, demonstration EMR platform. You might have a service harness, which different EMRs could plug into. And if that harness is robust, well described, then the vendor gets to experiment with what's the presentation layer look like. And I think that actually is going to be much more doable than a smart architecture in the near term. So I'll note, I mean, I think the objective for this kind of a sandbox is to have service standard uh, interfaces, APIs, uh, services, et cetera. So 
Uh, for example, uh, this VA environment, uh, and currently it's being done by a group called Cognitive Medical Systems with Emory Fry, uh, uh, formerly with the Department of Defense. Um, uh, the VA commissioned not only the, uh, the inclusion of, for example, the um, uh, OpenCDS as a distance support service that's H HL solving compliant, VISTA, et cetera, but we also commissioned the development of new service interfaces for things like an ordering service, an event publication and subscription service for triggering events, um, uh, communication service, et cetera. And there are open source implementations that match the now HL7 draft standards for those services. So I, I think the intent for something like this is to make it so that any EHR, as long as they were compliant with these APIs and services, interfaces could work and welcome anybody to, to join, but to have something working because it's, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to work on things collaboratively when you're not actually in the same development environment. Um. I agree fully with the concept that this is not genomic specific, I don't believe. Um, if we take the model of the PBRNs, it's an investment in infrastructure on which you can, you can test something that hundreds of thousands of providers are currently using. I mean, somehow this got pushed out to the entire country and there are a lot of frustrated clinicians because this is pretty tough to do. It's, it, there's not much easier than just handwriting a few things that get done. Um, we have to sort of nail down details of, of order writing. I mean, just the fundamental unit of how to order write and do it as slick as possible, but it's not genomic specific. So I think we're at a point now where we'll uh, sort of begin our synthesis of this uh, um, session. So I'll uh, turn it back to Ken and uh, Casey to kind of uh, see what uh, um, what points were um, extracted from the discussion and go from there. Um, so I guess just to, we, so we started out with a lot of discussion about workflows and the roles of the, of uh, different care providers or patients or, or caregivers, just the roles of several different um, potential uh, stakeholders, and then we also we talked a bit about uh, use cases um, for decision support, um, including involving the family, uh, as well as um, incorporating different pathways for um, for genomics. Um, let's see. There is some uh, outline of scenarios, when to order, gen when to order a genome versus a single gene, how to interpret the data, what actions to take currently versus um, in the future, so you want to know what to do now. And then we also talked about uh, the, uh, a little bit about dual purpose of, um, inter of, uh, of genomic modules evolving and um, the interface between EHR, CDS, and limb systems. Uh, also, what the, uh, one thing that came up is that um, what the end user needs isn't always known, and so uh, whether we need to look at these in a, um, in, in a uh, research environment versus um, versus a quality improvement environment. Um, there were also several uh, issues with uh, how do we actually um, think of decision support uh, from the point of view of, of the patient. Um, do, we can, do we think of uh, the support more broadly in terms of um, delivering that using the PHR? Also, adaptability of the system. So once you initially get information, does that uh, change do you want to uh, do you want to change uh, what's displayed over time, and um, how do we avoid duplicate genomic testing? So, keep, uh, so how do we support these kinds of things within the decision support environment? Um, there is some discussion about uh, closing the loop. So, seeing what's the impact of um, what's the impact of decision support over time, and thinking about that ahead of time before uh, we actually implement CDS. Uh, again, there's a long discussion about, uh, about involving the patients, um, 
and thinking about shared understanding, so maybe we might provide a family history report to both the provider and the patient, and that's something that's going on, and thinking about metrics like readiness to cha for change. Also engaging with the VA, uh, which is, is now providing uh, data directly to patients. Um, we also talked about uh, models for storage and transportability and, uh, and how to involve, um, how, how to be a rein reimbursed for these kinds of things and uh, how, how uh, vendors might be involved. And one of the, the, we had a long discussion that we just finished up with uh, talking about uh, a, a sandbox for, for learning about uh, or, or for collaborating on decision, su decision support processes and getting input from end users. So I'll just uh, try to uh, add a few notes. Um, so with workflow, I think the consensus was just there's a lot of different potential ways of doing this and we need to investigate. One thing I hadn't anticipated but seemed to be a very common theme is that we really need to quantitatively identify the problem we're trying to solve in, in terms that would be of interest outside the genomic medicine community, like what are the, like the adverse drug events for the CPOE context kind of notion so that we can understand you know, when we, what we're trying to solve and uh, when we've been successful at it. I think that's really important. Um, with regard to scaling, we had a lot of uh, sort of back and forth on this, but the take home I took with the whole genome sequencing is there's a lot of issues, but that could be a game changer in terms of scaling. And, and so if we could have that data and get over the, the, ra the reasons why it, it's hard and actually have that data, and not have to wait a few days for genetic test results to come back, et cetera. I think the consensus was a whole new world of opportunities would come available. So I think that's a very uh, important place for this uh, group to pursue. Uh, we also talked about the need to demonstrate return on investment. Um, and I think the notion of uh, if defining the problems in uh, uh, non genomic medicine, but more sort of general clinical, general uh, uh, financial terms makes sense. Uh, Jeff made the point that distance support is uh, perhaps needed to develop the evidence of genomic medicine. And I think that's a great point because it, of the complexity of actually implementing some of these algorithms. It's perhaps not even possible to have an intervention for genomic medicine in many cases without uh, distance support in the first place. And so that really raises distance support from uh, implementing what's known as best practice to actually developing best practice, which um, sort of breaks the model for a lot of the ways we typically think about evidence generation and then adoption, but um, uh, probably needs to be done. We talked about federal regulations having a potential important role to play and also economics being a very important driver and um, that being an, probably an active uh, agenda for, uh, for work to really understand how does the current and uh, moving healthcare economic landscape uh, change what needs to be done in this field. And then we uh, closed really with talking about um, uh, the notion of a sandbox and the notion of uh, consortium-based testing of some proposed standards. And this really resonates with me because it's, I think it's needed. It's, poten it's potentially a big win because if these efforts can align with what's going, being pushed by uh, lots of groups, and I can tell you from the operational healthcare environment, things that ONC and CMS are doing and requiring get inordinate amounts of attention because you have to do it if you want to get paid. And that's, that's, a, that's a big uh, carrot. So I think uh, figuring out a way that this community can engage with that and perhaps have a sandbox, have demonstration, uh, uh, implementations, et cetera, seems like a very practical thing that could be done to really advance this field. Great, thank you. Um, that I certainly uh, seem to capture the discussion very well. Any um, uh, additions or corrections that anybody uh, around the uh, two U's would, uh, I could say double U's, I guess, mm -hmm. um, uh, would care to make for that? Great, okay. So the last um, uh, agenda item today is um, going to be extremely short. Um, the summary of day one. Um, I think the, the summary is it's over.
Uh, we survived. <laughs> Everybody, for the most part, is still, uh, is still conscious. So these are all good things. Um, it's been an incredibly productive discussion. Um, what's going to happen next is that uh, while all of you can go off and, uh, uh, and you know, eat or uh, walk or exercise or go to bed or whatever it is you want to do, uh, Blackford and I will have the task of um, taking the information from the different sessions, uh, trying to organize that uh, and so that tomorrow morning uh, the uh, first uh, order of business will be to um, come back with you about what, what we think uh, we heard, where there are areas of agreement from the different sessions that we've had today that might be able to be uh, combined so that we don't have a laundry list of 18 things. Um, not add anything to the desiderata if we can possibly uh, avoid it. Um, and then uh, try and do a little bit perhaps of prioritization using uh, prioritization metrics that are yet to be developed. Um, we will lead off with that. Uh, we ha we're scheduled for an hour on that. I would be very surprised if we actually use all of that hour. Uh, but essentially what we'll want to do after we do that presentation uh, is to then uh, have a uh, discussion, uh, um, perhaps uh, focusing on certain things that we've identified that we think we need to uh, flush out a little bit more, um, but hopefully to um, then be able to synthesize uh, a list of here are some next steps uh, that this group would recommend moving forward and potentially even some ideas about how we might be able to uh, move that forward. So. Um, any questions uh, or comments before we adjourn? Again, I want to thank uh, Casey and Ken for uh, leading us through the last session. Um, and thanks to all of you for your very active uh, participation. And for those of you who have been uh, listening on the web, uh, thank you very much. And, and continue to send in your feedback uh, via Twitter. We are uh, taking a look at that. So. Uh, uh, with that, I'll uh, let you all go and enjoy your evening.